We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to offer his blessings and salutations upon his last and final prophet, our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his kin and his companions and all those who follow his guidance to the last day. He has left for us a clear, pristine path. Its day is as its night, and all those who waver from it will find nothing but destruction. So I'm very honored uh, to be with you here tonight at Drexel. We came here last year, I think, for a short program. So hopefully this will be the first of four sessions about the biography or seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And fortune has it that we begin in the very same month that he was born, وسلم, the first spring, Rabi' al-Awwal. I believe yesterday was the 12th. Uh, some people may be seeing it today as the 12th, depending upon the news sighting. So it's very auspicious that we also begin uh, at the same time that we celebrate his birth. So the way we have it divided is chronologically, more or less. There are many, many different ways you can approach the biography of the seer of the Prophet Muhammad So what we decided to do is take two sessions about his life in Mecca, which would include the Hijrah, and then two sessions about his life in Medina. But before we get into all of that, I think it's important to think about why we study, or why we should study, uh, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why is it important? Who was he? And when you look at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you go through, I've been to some of these book fairs, uh, associated with some of the, uh, uh, you know, the Islamic organizations that have these bazaars and book fairs and things like that. And if you if you peruse the titles that they have, sometimes you see, you know, Muhammad as uh, statesman, Muhammad as warrior, Muhammad as something. But the most important attribute of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the one that we should be most concerned with is Muhammad as Prophet of God. There might have been other roles that he played in his life, in his mission as a prophet, but the most important and the overwhelming, overarching attribute and role that he plays was that he is Rasulullah. He is the Messenger and the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is how we know him. That's how we should think of him. Um, some people with good intentions perhaps took other aspects of his life and tried to show how intelligent he was or how smart he was or how uh, uh, clever he was or how he was able to bring the tribes together with his statesmanship. And to us, the more important aspect is all of that came about because of prophethood, وسلم, not because that he was clever or that he was intelligent or that he was a statesman, which he was all of those things. But the reason that we study him and the reason that we follow him, the reason that makes him who he is, is that he was the prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so usually when we talk about biographies, life history, we start with the birth and end with the death. But this is not like any other biography. When we talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we really want to talk about him, we start with the beginning of creation, not when he was actually born. And if we want to talk about the end, the end will be all of our end. When he greets us on the other side of the help of the pool, and we have crossed over the sirat, inshallah, that narrow pathway over hellfire, and then we make it to the other side where he, with his own noble hand, will quench our thirst. May Allah give grant us that, inshallah. So that's, that's the end for us. And not even the end. Then we accompany him in paradise. We see him there, we spend time with him even more. Those who were with him in this life and also those who weren't with him uh, during his lifetime and those who came after. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu remarked in one of the hadith, he said, Ashtaqtu ila ikhwani. He said, I am longing for my brothers. And then the Sahaba around him, they said, Alasna ikhwanaka ya Rasulullah? Are we not your brothers, Prophet of God? He said, no, antum ashab. You are my companions, but my ikhwan, my brothers, the one who come later, are those who have not seen me 
but believe in me and follow me nonetheless. So all of us collectively and individually, we are the ikhwa and akhawat, we are the brothers and sisters of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So when we talk about his beginning, it's before his birth. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he remarked that he was a prophet of God while Adam السلام, was still in the state of clay before even the spirit and the soul was put forth into him. He was the prophet of God. And we know from the Quran, if you read the Quran and you watch carefully the verses of the Quran, that all of the messengers and prophets who came from Adam السلام, the first, all the way to Jesus ibn, or Isa ibn Maryam, the last prophet before Muhammad وسلم, they all came with a universal message. And the same universal message that we know today. لا إله إلا الله There is no God or deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa Muhammad Rasulullah And Muhammad is the prophet and messenger of God. So they all came with that twin message. And they all foretold of a prophet who would be coming later, who would appear in a particular part of the world. Some of them said he would appear in Arabia and gave more detail. Some of them actually gave a description. Some of them even said his name, like the Quran says about uh, Jesus, where he mentions there will be a prophet coming after me, Wismuhu, Ahmad. And Ahmad is one of the names of the Prophet Muhammad. So all of the prophets before him knew him, and they became reacquainted with him if they hadn't actually known him before, which we'll get into later in the course or in the third session, the day of the Isra and Ma'raj, the day where the, of the Prophet's ascension. And where he led all of the prophets that came before him in prayer. And then he also met several of the prophets in the seven heavens that he ascended to on his way to having that discourse with his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of us might say, well, you know, that's that all sounds good. And um, but you know, talking about he was he was actually around before he was actually born, and he ascended through the heavens and you know, when we're studying here in university and we kind of take things in a scientific manner, you know, we learn facts, you know, one plus one equals two, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, that's science, that's knowledge, that's facts. How do we know all this to be true? You know, why, why should we accept all of that? It's, it says so in the Quran and some of the Hadith, but why is that the thing that we take to be true? And I advise you as my fellow brothers and sisters to be really careful when you hear people say things like, you know, religion is belief, but then, you know, we want to take it from real knowledge. We want to talk about knowledge. We want to talk about facts. You know, give me the data. Give me the, you know, the lowdown of how it really is and not necessarily this stuff that you're coming up in your religion, which is a belief and you're entitled to your personal belief, right? But when we talk about What's our common and shared knowledge, usually put in the context of, you know, data, facts, empirical, experiment, that type of thing. And this is one of the, I'd say, the maladies of the post-enlightenment period that we're living in, where there used to be a time just a few hundred years ago where people accepted the idea that there was knowledge beyond empirical knowledge, and that there were things that you couldn't necessarily perceive by your five senses, that you couldn't necessarily fathom by seeing it or hearing it. People accepted that. But Europe went through a period of history and obviously it affected things here in America and even in the so-called Muslim world as well, where there was this divide between what was accepted by, uh, from scripture and then what was accepted by so-called scientific or empirical knowledge. And so we know this to be true in a number of ways. One of the beautiful things about Islam is that it doesn't just ask you to kind of accept something from a particular angle only. There could be a myriad of ways where you arrive at the same conclusion, right? And because we as human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with certain faculties. So we have intellect, we can perceive things, you know, not just our sensual perception of the things we see and hear, but interpreting that sensory data and understanding it, right, and then imbibing it and then recalling it later on in, terms, in the way of memory, these are things that the human being has been endowed with for a reason, 
right? And so um, that's not the only thing he's been endowed with. We also have this type of perception, which is a little bit different than what we can actually see and hear. And sometimes we can't describe it. We can't put it in words. But anyone who has a heart, right, can perceive love, for example, or can perceive or feel hatred, or can feel happiness, or can feel sadness. These are not activities of the mind. These are activities of the heart. And Islam talks to us in all of these different levels. It can speak to our intellects. It can speak to our hearts. It can speak to our sensory perception. And so understanding the message of Islam, understanding the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu understanding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself requires us to be operating on all these different levels and not to dismiss one and say, well, that's not really knowledge or that's not really fact. You know, if someone were to say to you, you know, prove to me that you love Fulan or prove to me that you love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi You know, that's one of those things where you don't offer proof in the sense of empirical proof. Right? I can't sort of give you a data list and tell you why. The Quran mentions some ways where there are signs of love. Right? When you talk about obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obedience to the Prophet, وسلم, some people nowadays take that to mean, well, that's Islam. You know you're Islam when you're obedient to those two, when you're obedient to the religion and you follow what it says. That's a part of Islam. But the real heart of it, if you want to be uh, precise about it, it's not obedience. Obedience is a sign. It's an alama, right? If you're walking down the road and you see certain signs here and there, the sign doesn't tell you what reality is, but it points you to reality. And the reality of obedience is that it's based upon love, based upon muhabba. And this is with the text of the Quran. It's not some sort of far out, you know, uh, Sufi concept. It's based right in the very verses of the Qur'an. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say if you love Allah فَاتَّبِعُونِ Then follow me. Follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is an address from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the believers. And not only will you follow me, but there is something that comes after that. يُحْبِبْكُمُ Allah. Allah will then love you. And he will forgive your sins. But the more important aspect, the thing that he mentions first, is that the reciprocation of your love, and then it will be met by love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not just love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we speak about the Prophet, we don't really speak about him in the past tense. We're speaking about him as if he is with us. And he is with us. The Quran says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And know that Rasulullah is amongst you. They said this verse doesn't just pertain to the past, that this verse is valid now. And with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where he said, حَيَاتِي خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَمَمَاتِي خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَتُعْرَضَ عَلَيَّ أَعْمَالُكُمْ فَإِنْ وَجَدْتَ خَيْرًا حَمِدْتُ اللَّهِ وَإِنْ وَجَدْتَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ اسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَكُمْ رَبَّكُمْ My life is better for you, and my death is better for you. And your actions are brought to me in death, not in life. In the Hayat al-Barzakh, in the life that is before the life of the Day of Judgment. فَإِنْ وَجَدْتُ خَيْرًا So if I find good, then I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I thank Him. And if I find something else, not good, اِسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَكُمْ رَبَّكُمْ Then I ask Allah to forgive your sins. And this hadith the ulama have taken to mean that the Prophet Sallallahu does have a, a, a sense of perception even in the grave. How else could we explain the day or the night of Isra and Ma'raj when all of the Prophets were assembled and all of them passed except for Isa ibn Maryam, except for Jesus who didn't die yet. But the rest of them passed into the next life. But they were there in some sense, in some form, maybe one we can't perceive, but nevertheless, they have a life. And we know that if the shuhada, if the martyrs are alive in their graves, then the prophets themselves also are alive in their graves, even though in a manner that's not perceptible to us. So when we speak about the Prophet Sallallahu we speak about him not as a figure that has passed, but one that is alive. And the best way to remain, keep him alive is to have him alive in your heart.
we offer blessings and salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ. We say, Allahumma salli. Allahumma actually means you're asking Allah, you're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Him to offer salah on the Prophet ﷺ. And the salah from Allah is rahmah, it's a mercy. And so one of the qurubat, one of the ways to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is via His Prophet ﷺ. And the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man salla ala Rasulullah uh, marratan, salla alayhi ashra. Whoever prays upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, offers his blessings once, Allah will bless him ten times over. And it also said that our salutations and blessings reach the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When I say, Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak alayhi, he hears this in the world that he is in. And sometimes you can hear his response back because it's wajib to give a response. If someone gives you salam, right, then you have to say, wa alaykum as salam. So if your heart is alive with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love of his Prophet sallallahu and alive with the remembrance of God, whether you're sitting down or you're laying down or you're standing up as the Quran mentions, then maybe you can hear the response back in your heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So studying his life is important in many ways. One of the ways that we just mentioned, and I would add to that, is that we need to know him. And we can't know him unless we study everything about him. And there are two major sources, more or less, or two major genres, if you will, of how we can know about the Prophet One of them is actually the Sirah, which we will begin tonight, inshallah. And the other is called the Shama'in, which talk about the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad But they're actually kind of the same thing, because we can't know the characteristics of the Prophet except via his Sirah, his biography, what he did, how he interacted with people. The Shema'il gives, gives us, from the point of view of the Sahaba, the ones who were closest to him, his companions, what was he actually like? What was his facial expression? He was always smiling. What was the feel of his hand like? Some of them said it was like the finest silk. What was praying behind him like? Some of them said it was the lightest but yet the most complete prayer that we ever prayed when we prayed behind him. So these are aspects of the Prophet Sallallahu that are gleaned from, gleaned from his sirah and also from uh, reading the Shema'il themselves from um, the point of view of the companions. So many of the believers still maintain a relationship with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every day uh, in each tashahud in the middle of the four raka'ah, or the one that comes after the four, or at, at the end of the two, we say, As-salamu alayka, you and Nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As-salamu alayka, here the kaf, kaf al-khitab, means we're addressing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly. Ayyuhan Nabi. Ayyuhan Nabi to the Prophet, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And may Allah's mercy and blessings be upon you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, Whoever sees me in a dream has truly seen me because the devil or Satan cannot take my form in the dream. So there is this ilaqa, there is this relationship that is still maintained with many of the believers via the means of the dream or via the means of his remembrance in your heart. And maybe you may not be able to see him in the dream, that's not something you can control, but you can remember him in your heart. You can offer blessings and salutations upon him. All of us should at least be doing that at least a hundred times a day. To say, Allahumma salli wa sallam, wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And many of our ulama said that it's a type of shifa, it's a type of healing, especially a spiritual healing. It's also a type of guidance. When you feel like you don't know what to do and there's no one to ask and you don't have someone who's kind of in an authority position to, to consult, then let the Prophet ﷺ be your, your guide in this and offer blessings and salutations upon him and maybe you will find a way out or you'll find a, a path that, that you should be following. So if we look at the basis of the Risala, the message, the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu One of the things I was thinking about on the drive here is that I don't recall from any of my readings that anyone ever really rejected the message of the Prophet Sallallahu 
on its merits. The Quraysh did not reject uh, the message per se, but they rejected the ramifications of the message. So the tribe of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quraysh, as we'll see when we talk a little bit about the seerah, he was amongst the most trusted amongst them. He was Al-Amin. He was the trustworthy. He was the one that they left their uh, belongings with for safekeeping when they weren't around. But yet, when he began to preach his da'wah and preach his message, they rejected it. So it's not because they thought he was a liar. And even when asked, they said, Hal alihi Have you ever seen him lie? They said, no. And they said, this is not a face of a liar. But the ramifications, you know, the consequences of them having to accept that da'wah, this is what they had an issue with. This is what they had the problem with. And if you look to whenever people want to disparage Muslims, they usually attack the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In 2006, when the Denmark cartoons came about, the cartoons they took as an image, the image of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the turbaned man with a beard who had a bomb coming out of his turban, that's not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what their distorted perception of what they think he could be. And it was based actually not on anything they knew about him, but what they thought him to be based upon the actions of other Muslims, us. But they don't know him. How could they? How could they think such a thing if they actually knew him? So no one really ever rejected him. And the Quran says, They don't say you're a liar. They know you're not a liar. But the wrongdoers are those who, with the verses and signs of Allah, they struggle. They struggle with their own souls because they can't accept the consequences of such a thing. Even the Jewish tribes who had migrated to Yathrib, which later on became in Medina, and the only reason that they migrated there is because they saw in the scripture that a man, a prophet, would appear in this land. So they accepted the message. They were monotheists, but they rejected the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not because of who he was, but of course his tribal affiliations, because of his ethnicity. They had hoped and they had expected that the Prophet would be coming from Bani Israel, from one of the tribes of Israel, as Allah had given them before. All of the Prophets before him, nearly all of them were from Bani Israel, from uh, Abraham and Dawood and Sulaiman, Many of the prophets, Moses, Harun, Aaron, were from the tribes of Israel, Yaqub, Jacob. But this last and final prophet came from a different tribe, came from one of the Arab tribes, like his forefather Ismail, who was from one of the Arab tribes. So uh, I don't think anyone in our history has ever rejected Muhammad وسلم, or the da'wah based upon its merits or what they perceive it to be. It's based upon confusion, based upon a lack of understanding of what it is. And that onus is on us. If we really think about it, the perception that people have about Islam today, we really have no one to blame but ourselves. Of course, there are people out there who are trying to distort and are waiting for the opportunity to do so. But we provided them that opportunity to begin with. And the best da'wah, the best way we can show this message is via our own actions, via our own character. And that was the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He didn't change people's uh, lifestyle. He didn't change their, the way they dressed, really. He didn't change how, what mode of transportation they would take. He didn't change what they eat, not so much. But what he changed were the hearts. It was the hearts that changed. Because once the heart can change, then everything else is easy. As mentioned, as he mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi one of the hadith, there is a morsel in the body that if it's pure and purified, then everything else will be pure and purified. And if it's not, if it's corrupt, then everything else will be corrupt. Namely, that is the heart. And here, what he meant by heart, not necessarily the, the morsel of flesh that pumps blood with arteries and so forth, but that heart that makes us who we are, that heart that can that can love, that can hate, that can feel happiness, that can feel sadness. This is the heart, if it's salih, right? If it's right, if it's pure, then it will be that which will regulate the rest of the body.
So when we study this hero of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, we see the biography of a man who changed hearts. And in order to really, I think, appreciate that, you have to appreciate humanity to begin with. You have to appreciate what it, is, it means to be a human being. Because even the way that people lived back then, right, and they had a certain mode of dress, certain transportation, what they ate. You know, there are some Muslims today who kind of want to, they see the embodiment of Islam as in living as they did during the time period of the early Muslims, during the time period of Muhammad Wasallam. But that's not how we should be doing it. That's not how our ulama and teachers told us. They said we should be living like Muhammad Wasallam. The time period that he was living in was incidental. It wasn't the main important point. The main important point of who he was and how he acted and how he lived during that particular time period he was in. And in order to appreciate that, you have to go beyond forms. You have to go beyond what you can perceive with your senses and you have to go into meaning. Right? Like they say, uh, al-ma'ani wal mabani. Ma'ani are meanings. Mabani are just the edifices. They're the forms, they're the outside. So all of you see of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he traveled on camelback and that he ate uh, very simple food and he, and he sat like a Bedouin and that he wore the rida and the izar, which are all part and parcel of what, who he was during that time. But that's not even the most important aspect of who he was. The most important aspect of who he was is how was he with others? What were the meanings behind his interactions with others, behind the decisions that he made? behind even the circumstances he was presented with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he dealt with those particular circumstances. Then the meanings of the seerah come true. But we, we have too many people walking around kind of trying to drum in the message that, you know, you got to wear your pants a certain way and your, 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 your uh, hijab a certain way and you have to, you know, uh, talk in a particular way and there are certain things we shouldn't be doing. You know, we shouldn't be celebrating Mawlid, for example. When the Prophet Sallallahu was born, right, we know, all know Abu Lahab, who was his uncle, who was one of the most staunch opponents of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was so happy, he was so happy at the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he freed his slave woman, Thuwayba. And she was one of the first uh, wet nurses for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he freed her. And then the hadith in Bukhari, Sahih hadith that said, that the punishment upon Abu Lahab is lessened on Mondays, the day that the Prophet ﷺ was born, because he freed Thuwayba out of happiness for the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. So basically, they have Mawlid in Hellfire. They remember the Mawlid in Hell. Why else would Abu Lahab have a lesser punishment during that day than another day, as mentioned in the Hadith? So if it can lift the suffering of the denizens of hellfire in the next life, why would we not commemorate and remember the life and the birth and the death of Muhammad So it's not about a particular day either. It's about living it every day. It's about living it in here. But sometimes we need reminders. Sometimes we need to get together in groups. Sometimes we need to help each other. And so these type of commemorative events are merely a tool for us to do that. But the real remembrance is in here. So to get a little bit of perspective on how the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with the environment that he was in, it would be a good idea to look a little bit at the physical environment that he actually came about in, which was the Arabian Peninsula. And the Arabian Peninsula, it's uh, surrounded by bodies of water on three sides. So to the west, you have the Red Sea. To the east, you have what's called the Persian Gulf, or if you're in the Arabian Peninsula, they call it the Arabian Gulf. And then to the south, you have the Indian Ocean. And then to the north, it's land uh, where you have Jordan, Sur uh, Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and uh, up into uh, Asia Minor. And then after that, you have uh, Southern Europe. The particular area where the Prophet ﷺ comes from it's called, sometimes called Hijaz, which includes Mecca and Medina, which includes that Red Sea coast on the west. And sometimes it has a name called Tihama. And Tihama also includes that strip that's right on the uh, Red Sea coast. So the word Hijaz comes from Hajaza, which means barrier. 
And one of the things about that Red Sea coast is it's completely from north to south covered with a coral reef. So there are no natural ports on that, uh, on that coast. There never were. Jeddah is a modern port, the city of Jeddah where they made the port. But it's very difficult because ships can come in and they can get raked on the, uh, on the coral reef. So it provided sort of a natural barrier for people crossing over uh, from Africa or coming down from Europe if they tried to go the ocean route. So it was very treacherous to try to cross over into to the Arabian Peninsula. Yes? It includes the mountain region that's included within that strip, which is uh, the mountains of Mecca, and that they extend a little bit uh, north of that. And also uh, and Medina, which is further north. So that whole area is called uh, Hijaz or, or Tihama. So that was the, uh, the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. In the south, you had uh, the Yemen, which unlike the rest of the peninsula is actually uh, not as barren. So you can actually grow many things there. Uh, it was called Arabia Felix for a long time or Yemen is Saeed, happy Yemen, because there you're actually able to grow things. Um, and they had crops and they had uh, things that uh, were tradable. So Rahlat al Shita'i wa Saif, the two trips of the winter and the summer, which Quraysh would do annually. So in the winter, they would go down to Yemen, where they would trade goods with the Yemenis. And in the, uh, in the summer, they'd go down to in the summer, they'd go to Syria in the winter to Yemen. So they had tradable items there, which included food crops and other things that were not available in the interior of the Arabian Peninsula. The rest of the Arabian Peninsula was quite harsh. Um, most of it is barren desert. Most of the tribes that existed during that time were nomadic tribes. And so that means that they had to continually search for places where they can find one source of water and two shelter. And so they moved around a lot. Uh, Mecca was different. Mecca actually was a settlement. And as we know, Mecca was actually settled by uh, the descendants of Ismail السلام, and Hajar when she was left, uh, uh, his mother was left there and he has a young infant. And then the tribe of Jurhum came later on and found them. And hence the, uh, the two hills of Safa and Marwa when she ran back and forth. And finally the Zamzam sprouted forth. So that became a settlement. Uh, for the two main reasons, one, Zamzam, there's a natural water there, a natural well, and two, the Kaaba. So the Kaaba was built by Ibrahim and Ismail, uh, the two prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as mentioned in the Quran, and it also became a site of pilgrimage. Somewhere along the line, during the history of the Arabian Peninsula, you can find this in some passages of Ibn Hisham, Sirat Ibn Hisham, uh, idolatry was introduced into the peninsula. Before that, they considered themselves to be followers of Ibrahim, of the religion of Abraham, And followers of Abraham, even when idolatry started to appear, they were called al Hunafa or Hanif. And Hanif means someone who's pure, or pure of heart. So they were looking for the pure religion of Ibrahim, and they continue to exist. Some of the major Sahaba were in this category, like Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr Siddiq never worshipped an idol, or never believed in idols, but he was one of the Hanafa looking for that religion of Ibrahim. Um, in terms of the way they lived or governed themselves, they didn't really have any type of central government. They didn't have a system of laws, a formal system of laws. It was a very tribal culture. And so, you know, nowadays when we say, you know, where are you from, or, you know, we talk about what citizenship you are, what country you, you're, you're what's your nation if you're American or English or Spanish or you know whatever Mexican whatever particular ethnicity or whatever country you belong to that's how we tend to self-identify but in the Arabian Peninsula they identify themselves by their tribal affiliation so they were Quraysh they were Qais Alan they were Tamim they were Al Aus they were Khazraj so that was the apparatus by which they found protection and which they can maintain their life. If you happen to be unfortunate enough that you find yourself outside of 
a tribe, then your safety is not guaranteed. And this was the case for some of the Sahaba who came from outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Salman al-Farisi, right, came into the Arabian Peninsula and he found himself uh, enslaved because he was, one, he was a Persian, so he wasn't an Arab, and two, he didn't have an Arabian tribe by which to sort of have his back, to be his protector. And it was even when he came into Islam, they used to ask him, you know, Salman, what tribe are you from? You know? And he would reply, Ana Salman ibn Islam. I am Salman, the son of Islam, or from Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said about Salman, he said, Salam, Salman minni. Salman is from me. He is with me. So he granted him sort of ceremoniously the highest affiliation he could give, namely to be directly affiliated with the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So tribal uh, allegiance was, was paramount, was very important during that time. And when the Quran describes the Jahiliyyah, right, and it says Hamiyat al Jahiliyyah, in other words, the not just, you know, we usually translate it as ignorance, like they didn't know anything, but that's not very, a very accurate portrayal. Their Jahiliyyah was based on the sense that their Nufus, right, their Hamiyyah, their uh, Hamas, their high spiritedness got the better of them. But Outside of this, they did have certain properties and traits that were admirable, right? They, they had the concept of uh, helping the traveler, of uh, giving refuge to the visitor, of honesty, of trustworthiness. These were all held in high esteem, generosity. There are many of the uh, pre-Islamic or Jahili people who lived and they wrote odes about them, about how generous they were, like Hatim al Ta'i. Hatim al Ta'i was one of the ones who lived in, uh, before Islam, and even the Prophet ﷺ mentioned him, even though he never lived until the time of the Prophet of Muhammad. ﷺ. But, you know, they said, and how generous he was. So one time, his Hatim al Ta'i, he was uh, walking by and he found a man enslaved in chains. And he said, to the person who had enslaved him, you know, you should release him. He said, well, someone has to pay for it, or someone has to give me something else. He said, take me instead. So he, this was like a, a parable of how generous he was that even if he found someone enslaved, that he himself would, would take that place. So these were around in the Arabian Peninsula even before the Prophet Muhammad came about. That's why he said in the hadith, I have not been sent except to perfect character, not that character didn't exist beforehand, right? Because as Muslims, we believe we have a certain fitrah. We have this primordial state that we're born with that tends towards good, not towards evil. So we don't see Muhammad Sallallahu as a type of savior who has come to save us from the original sin that our forefather Adam, when he fell from paradise. That whole narrative is completely anathema to the Islamic narrative. The Islamic narrative holds that Adam alayhi salam was not a fall as a punishment, but he was ennobled when he went from paradise. Yes, he was told not to eat from a particular tree, and then Satan was able to dupe him and his wife Hawa into eating from it. But that was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to happen, obviously, aradahu. And it's also something that enabled us humanity collectively to understand what the relationship of the created with the creator is, namely a relationship of returning back to him. So the word tawbah, right? Adam, he made tawbah fataba alayhi. So this tawbah is returning to your origin. And our origin is to be in line with what Allah SWT has commanded us with. We would not really have a concept of this unless that whole scenario didn't play out in the way that it did. So we don't see that um, mankind is suffering, uh, collective suffering, because of the forbidden tree, or the forbidden, forbidden fruit that was eaten from the tree, and we're all collectively suffering because of it. Not at all. That's not our narrative. It's not our paradigm. And so, Muhammad Wasallam came to perfect people. He didn't come to save us from an original sin. And that means that we are people who tend towards good. In our makeup, we're good people. But somewhere along the line, you know, 
we can slip, we can make mistakes, we can have things that, um, you know, sort of cloud our thinking. The Jahili Arabs, even the things that we now read about that were so despicable, they thought there was a particular honorable reason they were doing it. So, for example, some of them uh, buried their baby daughters in the sand because they thought that was honorable. Of course, they were misguided in this. It's not honorable at all. And Sayyidina Omar was one of the people who actually did that. And he lamented his whole life because he had done that to, to one of his daughters. And the Quran mentions, right? The one who was buried alive in the sand, for what sin has she been killed? But they perceived this to be an aspect of, of honor. You know, that it's honorable to have sons, and if you can't care for the daughters, then this is what they did. Even the many wars that they fought from um, between each other that were over the trivialist of matters also was based with, on a sort of misguided concept of what they thought to be honorable. So nevertheless, uh, the environment that the Prophet ﷺ was born into in Mecca in particular, like we said, it was a settlement unlike much of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Mecca had a high status because of the Kaaba, because of the pilgrimage. Uh, this gave them this uh, sort of air of predominance over the rest of the tribes in the peninsula. To the degree that in the year that the Prophet ﷺ was born, we know about Abu al Ashram, who was the uh, Yemeni vassal from Eth originally the, for the kingdom of Ethiopia. And he built something that he wanted to replace the Kaaba. So he built this massive church, said to be somewhere around Sana'a in Yemen, uh, hoping that this would be something that would build a pilgrimage to Yemen, to Sana'a, and people would leave Mecca. Uh, didn't turn out as he planned, and not only that, one of the Qurayshis who had come down from uh, Mecca had defiled uh, the church. And so this ir you know, irked him, and uh, his ire rose, so he made a campaign to go towards Mecca to destroy the Kaaba. And this was the same year that the Prophet ﷺ was born. And we know that he was not able to. He was able to have all of the tribes in between Sana'a and Mecca, though, succumb to him. He defeated all of them until he reached Mecca. And until the elephant that he had in the front was unable to go any further. And then Tayr al-Ababil, the seagulls that came from the ocean with uh, small rocks that in were inflamed and destroyed his army and himself before they were able to reach Mecca. So it said the Prophet ﷺ was born about 50 or so days, maybe two months after that, so the year of the elephant. And most of the narrations say that he was born in Rabi al-Awwal, and most of those say the 12th. So it's not uh, something of complete consensus, the date of his birth, exactly. But most of the narrations point to that, the 12th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal. Some of them point to other days in Rabi'ah al-Awwal. Some of them point even to some day in Ramadan. But the one that, uh, that Ibn Hisham uh, reports and also the other Sira narrators is that he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal. So his father, his name was Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather, was a very prominent chieftain of Quraysh. And he also had a nickname called Shayb al Hamd, or the Shayba, the, the gray haired one who was, who was to be praised. And he was one of the leaders of, uh, of the Quraysh tribe. And Amin ibn Tawahab also uh, was from a related tribe that was close to uh, the environs of Yathrib, of Medina. And so when the Prophet ﷺ was born, the Sira narrates that, one, during her pregnancy, she didn't feel any of the normal things that pregnant women feel, like morning sickness or difficulty. And even the birth itself was a bloodless birth. He was born and there was, it's also said that he was uh, born circumcised and no blood. And that when he actually, uh, when he came out of the birth canal, that they saw a light. And this is his mother remarking, Amin ibn Tuhab, they saw a light that went all the way to the uh, city walls of Kisra, the city walls of the Persian Empire, which extended 
hundreds if not a thousand miles away and that the idols in the Kaaba were destroyed that night, burst and were crushed and that the, uh, the fire of the Zoroastrians that was held since the time of Jesus, constant flame uh, was extinguished. So all of these were irhasat or preliminary signs of this momentous occasion, the birth of uh, Muhammad وسلم. And we said that uh, the Quraysh were very happy, especially Abu Lahab, who freed his uh, servant slave, and that she was the first uh, wet nurse for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. The Quraysh, or the Arabs at the time, they had a tradition of finding uh, someone to nurse the child other than the mother. Um, there might be a variety of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that they thought that if someone who came from outside of the, the city life, so-called Mecca was considered to be a small town or a city or a settlement, those who came from the more nomadic areas sort of had a, a pure lifestyle and so it was advantageous to have someone nurse from there. So Thuwayba, she was the first uh, nursing mother and then the second was someone known by the name of Hanima Sa'di from Bani Sa'ad. And Bani Sa'ad was a tribe that was a little bit outside the uh, outskirts of Mecca. And so they had a tradition on a regular basis that the women of Bani Sa'ad would come into Mecca to uh, take up the different children and then they would take them back to their abodes in Bani Sa'ad and they would stay the full nursing period, which was usually about two years, which was the custom at the time. So that's kind of an example of something that was customary that would exist in the peninsula, but it was a circumstance that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came into. But that's not the important aspect of it. So we see this Halima Sa'liya, she was actually one of the more uh, poorer ones of, of the tribe of Bani Sa'ad. And she had a very slow female donkey that she would ride back and forth. And so she was the last one to get there. They had all like passed her on the way. So she's riding on her female donkey and they're all like, see you later. And they get there to Mecca before she does. So everyone was distributed by the time she got there. And the only one left was Muhammad وسلم. The reason he was the only one left because he was an orphan. His father had died uh, early on um, before, his, uh, before his birth. And so knowing that he was an orphan, then it would be quite difficult they wouldn't have that much to pay in terms of money. So even though Abdul Muttalib was still alive, his grandfather, and he was a prominent chief of Quraysh, he was not a very wealthy man. So it was not, they didn't see it as advantageous to take uh, this young orphan boy back. But Hadima, seeing that no one else was there, she accepted and she took him back with her. So immediately she realized that there was something different about this young boy. One, when she tried to nurse him, she found that, because she had her own son, obviously, that she was nursing uh, at the same time. His name was Maysara. So she was nursing Maysara and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and she found that she had enough milk for the both of them and then some. When before, she may have had trouble actually nursing her own child by himself. And then when she got on her uh, female donkey, all of a sudden it was going quite fast to the degree that she got home before everybody else did. So they had passed her on the way, they had taken the children that they're supposed to take, they got on their way, they left, but she managed to, to pass all of them and she got there. And then when she got back to uh, her abode, she found as the days passed, for example, her female camel was now giving much more milk than it ever gave. The crops that she was raising, that she had planted, now were, were sprouting forth in a manner that never happened before. Uh, she found that she was quite enriched as a result of the blessing, the barakah of this young infant, Muhammad وسلم, that she was caring for and nursing for. And if you consider this, uh, it shows you that people of good, people of khair, people who have blessing with them, they bring blessings to others. They bring relief to others. They bring goodness to others. And this was very early on during the prophetic mission. Not even the mission didn't even start yet, but even as an infant, we can see the signs for this. And so in our own lives, we need to reflect on, upon ourselves. Are we people of good? Do we bring good to others? Do we bring relief? 
Do we bring kindness? Do when people see us, are they happy to see us? Or are they avoiding us? Are we sanctimonious? Do we push people too much? A particular idea of what we think religiosity should be or a particular way they should behave? Or do we bring khayr? Right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, khayrun nas an nas. The best of people are those who are most beneficial to others. So part and parcel of this great religion of Islam is bringing benefit to others in whatever way. Right? In terms of a smile, in terms of a sadaqa, in terms of giving someone a ride somewhere, taking them to lunch, right? We think little of these things, but it was these little things that actually are reflections of who you actually are, right? We need to get out of the box of thinking that Islam is kind of this sort of uh, totalitarian ideology that we kind of have to push on people, and if they don't fit in a particular uh, form that we have, or we think that the way that Islam should be, then we kind of dismiss them. Prophet Sallallahu didn't dismiss anybody. Right? The Sahaba report that when people came to him and they asked for something, he never said no. He would either give them what he was able to give or try to fulfill their need in some other way. But to say no, to reject them, was not his, his way. He was not a person who rejected people. So, after he stayed some time uh, in Bani Sa'd, and also they used to send their children there because it was thought that the, the Arabic language they spoke was more pristine. The people of Mecca were traders, and so they often went to the north and went to the south, and they dealt with other people who had slight linguistic variances in, in language, or even spoke a, a completely different language. But towards the interior of the Arabian Peninsula, it was seen as a purer form of, uh, of Arabic, and also a purer form of life. So they, uh, they relinquished the first two years for for their children to nurse there. So he nursed for a while and he stayed there and they noticed that even when he was one year of age that he looked like someone, an infant who was two. So he was a little big for his size, he was quite healthy and quite active. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad as a young infant. Until one day he was playing with some of the other young boys, he was probably about a little bit over two, and these what appeared to be two men came and they took him and the other young boys with him saw all of this happening and they split his chest and they took out his heart, bloodless, nevertheless, they took out his heart and they washed it in this vessel and they put it back. So Maysara, who was the um, nursing, he was the brother of the Prophet Muhammad because he nursed with, with him, with his mother, went back and told his mother what had happened. And the children went back and told what had happened. So she, keep, she became frightened. Uh, when she heard this, and, went, and she went and saw the boy, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did look different, he looked pale. And this was the shak al sadr this was the splitting of the chest by the two angels who came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it is said in some of the narrations that when they took out his chest, they found this small little black spot, and they washed it and removed it, and they said, that is the nasib, that is what little of the shaitan that was there, and we have removed it, and now it's gone. And this was not the first time or the last time where this happened. It's also said that it happened uh, the night of Isra and Ma'raj, that Shaq al-Sadr. And some reports also indicate the night of uh, Ghar Hira when he first received the prophetic message. But probably this was the most prominent time that it happened, or definitely the first time early on uh, when he was an infant. And so you might say, you know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make him safe from the shaitan, he didn't have to go through all of that, right? He could have just made it his heart in a way that they didn't need to have the chest split open and, and this sort of, uh, sort of uh, tragic or almost, you know, frightful event happened to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But when we look to how things turn out, to how circumstances come about, there's always wisdom behind it. There's always a hikmah, right? You may ask, why was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi orphaned so early from both parents? His father before he was born and then his mother when he was about six. He was orphaned without both mother and father. And then he was in the care of his grandfather for some time and then when he died in the care of his uncle. And you could say, well, he could have had both parents and he could have grown up and he could have done this and he could have done that. But all of these things, especially when you look to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his message, it's significant, right? And one of the significant things is that the Prophet ﷺ has to be a hujjah, he has to be a proof. 
he has, his message has to be so clear that no one can try to disparage it. And so growing up as an orphan without, you know, they could have said, well, you know, he learned that from his, his forefathers, from his grandfather or from his father who were prominent in Quraysh and they had knowledge of the book and they gave it to him and, you know, it would be seen as maybe as an impediment or an obstacle to the understanding of the message. So the Prophet ﷺ lived a life of what we call, there's a term that they say, tajreed. And tajreed means you live a life of without. He didn't live uh, an easy life. He didn't have even many of the creature comforts for the people of his time. He didn't have those things. The Aisha mentioned that he never ate leavened bread, you know, bread that was when, that's manhul, where the uh, the huff of the wheat is filtered out. He ate it with it, so it was coarse bread that he would eat. Uh, he slept on a palm straw mat that when he got up, then the imprint of that straw mat would be seen on his body. These were things other people who lived in the same time as him, they didn't contend with. But he lived a life of tajreed, because his life was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these easy things, these creature comforts, even the comfort of having both parents alive at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a sense, deprived him of these things to give him something else, to give him something better or greater. Um, and also as, as an example for us, you know, when we look to uh, those people that we look up to, or we look to people we look for guidance or leaders, you know, if we find that they kind of living something that's way beyond what we can possibly picture of, of beyond our means, it's kind of a little bit of a letdown. You know, well, you know, that great person, but he's, he's got millions of dollars and he has this castle and he has this. So it kind of puts them outside of the realm of reality of I can emulate such a person. But one of the, the great things about the Prophet said so in his greatness, he was also so humble. And his greatness was not in his material possessions or in his wealth or what he had or any of those things. But yet he was the most dignified of all of the people of Mecca. And he was the most dignified of all of creation. So dignity doesn't come out of what you possess. Dignity is about what's in here, about the type of person you are, the type of character that you project to others. And that really is one of the main themes of his da'wah, of his risala. Because he had many opportunities to avail himself of much wealth, and in a legitimate manner, but he did not, because that was not because he was zahid. That's not what I think. I don't think he said, well, you know, I have to show the people that, you know, I don't care about these things. The thing is, he didn't care, right? Zuhud, being an aesthetic, doesn't mean that you tell it to yourself, well, I'm going to stay away from these and put them away because, you know, I want to be above them. The true zahid doesn't care if he has them or he does have them. They're not even... He's not even thinking about them. They're not even on the mind to begin with to think about should I avail myself or not avail myself. So the Prophet Muhammad he lived that, that difficult life. Um, but it was a life lived, truly lived in every sense of the word. Even when he died, he had almost nothing in terms of possessions. He was in debt to one of the Jews of the Jewish tribes, not for something of, you know, we would think, you know, is a, a value, but for feeding his family. So he actually had to go in debt to feed his family toward the last days of his life. And if you study the life of the great men and the great kings and things of, of, of that sort, you find they had all this material wealth and these possessions and these concubines and these many lands and many horses and so forth. And that was the greatness. We read about Alexander the Great and how he conquered the world and so forth. But... The Prophet Sallallahu did more than conquer the world, he conquered hearts. And he conquered the most difficult hearts. You know, imagine the most difficult people that you've come across, the most recalcitrant, um, you know, haughty, arrogant people that you can think about. The Prophet Sallallahu was able to conquer those hearts and make them a completely different person, right? It's easy to build a city, demolish a city, put up another city, but to build a heart, change a person, to make them something completely different. Umar ibn al-Khattab, one night he's going to the Prophet Sallallahu to kill him. That was his intention. And he came back a Sahaba. He came back a Muslim, the same night, hours later. That heart was changed completely. That was the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu That's the real theme, the real message of 
the prophetic message of uh, Muhammad So after the incident with the angels, Hadima got scared, obviously. She was a little bit frightened, so she took him back to uh, Mecca to give him back to Amin ibn Tawab, his mother. But she had a change of heart while she was there, and then she took him for a further uh, two years after that. So he stayed with her until he was four, and then he returned back. And then it was a short time later that his mother passed, and then he went to the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And then when Abdul Muttalib passed away, then he went to the care of his uncle, Abu Talib. And Abu Talib had a few sons who um, were the cousins, obviously, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amongst them were Ja'far and Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he was also close with one of the other uncles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hamza. And so Abu Talib also was not a man of means. He was not wealthy. He was a noble man, and he was well respected. He was the leader of Banu Hashim, which was the sub tribe of Quraysh, which was the tribe of Muhammad Sallallahu But he was not a man of means, and so even he had many children. And he actually let Jafar go live with Sayyidina Hamza uh, because of the difficulty he had in, in, in supporting all of these children. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the household of, of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was a trader. So he would, as were many of the Meccans, so he would make the annual trip uh, in the summer to uh, Syria and then in the winter to Yemen. So one of these annual trips, when the Prophet ﷺ was about 12, he took him with him up to Syria. And there, while he was uh, encamped, he met this monk who was named Bahira al-Rahib, or Bahira the monk. And this monk came up to a uh, Christian monk. He came to Abu Talib and he said, are you this boy's father? And Abu Talib said, yes, I'm his father. He didn't want to reveal you know, the whole complex relationship. So he said, no, I don't think you're his father. And then Abu Talib realized that he, he understood you know, that he obviously wasn't his son. He said, well, I'm his uncle. And then he asked him another series of questions about when he was orphaned and you know, where he came from and, and so forth. And so Bahayr uh, al-Rahib was able to see Yatafarras and he saw that this was the prophet that he had read about in the scriptures that he had, in the scrolls, in the gospels, whatever he had that was in his possession at the time, he realized the signs and he saw them in the prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And the Quran says, They know him like they know their own children. So he saw these signs in this young 12-year-old boy, and he knew that this was the future prophet. And he noticed many signs. He noticed the ghamama, the cloud that followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even at this young age, when he would walk by inanimate things like rocks, they would give salam to him and he could perceive it. Animals would give salam to him and he could perceive it. So there was an understanding and he understood that he was different than other people. And so Bahaira, he told him, don't bring him back here again. Have him go back home because I fear there will be people here who see the signs in him. They will do, they will try to do harm to him. So he returned back to uh, Mecca with his uncle. And he did not, I think, go on any other trips with his uncle until he went as a young man after that. So we don't have too much in terms of reports of what happened between the ages of 12 at that time until he became a young man at the age of about uh, the early 20s. But he had built a reputation as an honest, sincere person that can be trusted with anything. And so his reputation, in a sense, preceded him. And his reputation preceded him to the degree that there was a prominent Qurashi woman who lived in Mecca at the time, who was quite wealthy. And in fact, she had several traders worked on her behalf, went and traded to the Yemen and to Syria. And she would be sort of the, you know, the business head, and they're the ones who are trading on her behalf. So she heard of uh, Muhammad, sallallahu She heard that he was honest, he was trustworthy. He had also, for a time, he was a sheep herder. This um, was before he became a trader. 
and she heard all of these good things about him. So she said, well, let me see if maybe I can work with him and do business with him. So she contracted with him and he went on this trip to Syria on her behalf. And she found that he was the most profitable out of all of the people that she was working with. And she also had sent her young servant boy with him. And he reported back to her and said, we saw these amazing things with him. He's unlike anyone else I've ever seen. And this woman's name was uh, Khadija bint Khawaid. So Khadija radiallahu anha, she was 40 years old at the time when she got to know the Prophet sallallahu and he was 25. And so it was kind of a little bit out of the ordinary for her to initiate a marriage proposal, but that's kind of exactly what happened. And so she had contacted a friend of hers who then contacted someone on behalf of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to uh, suggest marriage. And so then he spoke with one of his uncles and they, they, uh, they made the marriage proposal and the marriage was contracted. So the thing about Khadija radiallahu anha, a lot of people may not be aware, is that she was twice widowed before marrying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she had children from other marriages. Um, she had a son from the previous marriage that she was in. His name was Hind ibn Abu Hala, ibn Abi Hala. And he was a young boy at the time. And so the Prophet Sallallahu in a sense, became his stepfather. And he was what we call Al-Rabib, the one that he raised in the household, in his household, and treated him like his own son, even though he was from a previous marriage. So one, the Prophet Sallallahu married someone quite older than him, 15 years older, namely Khadija. She was 40, he was 25. And two, he had inherited more or less her son, too, who's living in the house with them. Uh, and she was twice widowed before. So one might say, well, he was 25, he was a young man, he could have married anyone there. But he knew of the noble character of Khadija, عنها. he had gotten to know her from the business dealings that he had with her. And so he had his mindset, even though she had initiated this marriage proposal. Um, and so that's out of the ordinary, even for the time, because people used to get married quite early, actually, quite young at the end. He could have had his pick of any of the young ladies of Quraysh. And so some of the allegations that people make later on when they hear more about the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he married nine wives and some of them were quite young and so forth. But if we look to this early example, he stayed with Khadija until her death and he married no one else. So he himself uh, came to about 55 years of age because that's when she passed. And uh, he... Uh, she was 55 when she passed. So 15 years later, he was 40. He had married no one else during that whole time. He did not take another wife. And she was the only one who bore him any children. And the rest of the other wives of the Prophet ﷺ even grew to be a little bit jealous of Khadija, especially Aisha. عنها, one time she said, you know, uh, Khadija was this, this old woman that you married, and now Allah SWT has given you something better. So why do you keep talking about her? Because one of the things that he used to do is visit the friends of Khadija after she had passed away. And he would send them gifts and things like this. So this is uh, an aspect of the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So love is not just loving someone, right? but it's also loving who they love. And not just loving who they love, but loving who they love not because of some material aspect that you can benefit from them, because she already passed away. So it's not like he was impressing her by treating her friends right or visiting her friends but because of his love then that's that much closer to his beloved and this was what made Aisha a little bit jealous and so when she said you know Allah has given you better than her he said he has not given me better than her Khadija was the one who you know consoled me she was the first one to believe in me the first believer she was the one who even helped me with her own wealth when no one else would and she is the only one who bore me children until that time so uh, all of these fala and all of these virtues that Khadija Rana had that he could not say about the other wives that he had. And so the aspect of love extending not just to what you love, but even what they love as well. And that's a deeper sense of the word. Uh, you know, and the Arab poet Majnoon Qais and Layla, Majnoon Layla, you guys know him, right? Sort of. So he had this... Uh, these lines of poetry 
where he, uh, you know, they saw him like kissing the walls of her house or hanging around the walls of her house. And they said, what are you doing? You know, why are you kissing the walls or hanging around the walls of your house? Uh, and he said, uh, It's not the love of the diyar, of the walls of the house that has made my heart burst in love, but the one who lives within them. The one who lives within them. So seeking even that which is a means to the beloved, right? It's a parable also for us. So we should love all of the people that the Prophet Sallallahu loves. We should love everyone that Allah loves. If Allah loves the repentant person, more than, for, as mentioned in the hadith, than the one who has, uh, is sitting in the desert and then his camel, all his provisions, runs away and he's left there to die and then he finds him later. How happy he is to see you know, his provisions back in his camel and that he knows he will live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, afrah, he is more happy in a manner that's appropriate to him than even that person who lost everything. And that's for the repentant person. He's more happy with the repentant person. So who are we to judge someone's tawbah? someone's repentance, someone's level of religiosity, right? The only one who has the right to judge is God. Allah judges, we don't judge. And if there's even an inkling of Iman in their heart, it's enough that Allah SWT will enter them into paradise just because of that even dharra, even that small amount of Iman. That means Allah loves them. So we should love who Allah loves and we should love also who the Prophet loves. So we can't claim to love the Prophet Muhammad SAW and not love his ikhwan, as he mentioned in the hadith, those who come after him and believe in him, and not love his sahaba, his companions, and not love his family, and his adil bayt, and the, uh, the descendants of his family. So all of these are manifestations of true love. But if it falls anything less than this, then know that your hope is not solid. Your love is not sincere. It's based upon maybe some benefit, some reaction that you're hoping for, something of the material world. But if you truly love, love is giving without expecting anything back. You give and you don't expect, nor do you want anything back. Love is for the sake of giving only, not for the sake of something that's coming back to you. So after the Prophet ﷺ married uh, Sayyidah Khadija, عنها, he still did work on her behalf. Uh, in trading, but he also uh, would, at this time he began to take some of these so-called sojourns or khalawat and retreat to Ghar Hira, to the mountain of Hira, which is uh, the mountain valley which overlooks the Kaaba. One of the things about uh, Hira I think still to this day, I don't think the tower is blocked the view, but if you go up there, then uh, you're able to see, or well, you should have been able to see back then definitely, the Kaaba, because there were no walls around it. I don't know if that's still the case today. Really? So one of the reasons that the Prophet said went to Hira specifically because he could have chosen a, a number of places around to, to, to go for Khalwa. He chose this specifically because he gave him a view of the Kaaba. So now we build things to block the view. Anyway, no comment. Um, so he would go there for five days at a time, ten, sometimes up to a month. And he would go up there and then he would retreat back down and say the Khadija would bring him provision and then he would see her and then he would go back up. So he would come back down every once in a while. But he had this aspect of retreating away from everything. And this is important. Uh, this uzla or this khalwa, you know, there's different words for it. Uh, we have a particular type that's called atikaf in Ramadan. They all have a similar meaning, which means a type of uh, khalwa means something to be khali, to be empty. So there's a type of a loneness aspect to it. Uh, uzla means to be separated from. So it's kind of leaving things aside. Atikaf means akafa ala shay, which means to say some place. So all of these aspects are included in the idea of uh, his retreats to the mountain of, 
of Hira. And it's one of the things I think modern people kind of lose, lose track of. We live in such a like always connected, plugged environment. Some people will even like have symptoms, literally symptoms of withdrawal if their iPhone is away from them for any period of time. Um, you know, if they can't check their WhatsApp or their Facebook or their things like that, they get like a little bit nervous. And so we become very dependent upon these little things, uh, devices, and our feeling of connection is it makes us feel connected. Like we don't want to miss anything. And the Prophet them, he was living in a time when people were doing all sorts of things in the Kaaba that was very distressing to him. Um, it became a polytheist center. They had all the idols there and people would go to sacrifice and even make the offer on the Kaaba in the nude and things like this. So he, um, he retreated away from all of this and people engaged in drinking and all sorts of things uh, that were, were, were offensive to, to his heart. So the retreat was important. The retreat was important to get away from that, to have a time to reflect, to contemplate. And he would stay five days, ten days, you know, on end until he would come back down. And um, if you feel like you can't really be alone by yourself except it doesn't feel right, then you got to really, really question yourself. Because every single one of us should have a khalwa or a uzla or a type of retreat of sorts periodically. You know, during the day, it could be towards the end of the day. When we're, you know, when you retreat to your bedroom and you're by yourself, or even, uh, you know, if you're not married, like most of you, I guess. Or if you have a roommate, but there's a, a way that you retreat and there's nobody else there but you, right? You know, some of us, the last thing we do before we go to sleep, we kind of check Facebook or check whatever. But, you know, you need a time to kind of review what you're really doing, right? To take a step back and kind of look at yourself from the outside. What have I done today? How have I lived today a life of khidma, this day, particular day of service, of faith, of generosity? What particular prophetic character attributes have I been able to manifest in myself today? Which one of those came out as I lived my life today? Or did I waste my day? Right? So there's hisab, hasabu anfusakum qabla to hasabu, take yourself into account before you are taken into account. This is one of the benefits of this khanwa, this retreat. And don't think that retreat is there for you to get away from everybody so they don't harm you. It's more for you to, for you to get away so that you don't harm them. Because your circumstances is something that is always going to be there. You have to deal with it. But how you deal with it, that makes up who you are. So for us, in, in the Islamic paradigm, khalwa is never a permanent thing. We don't have monasteries. Right? The Prophet said, لا رحبانية في الإسلام There's no monasticism, which means that you take as a permanent form, form of life, you go retreat to the mountain and you kind of live by yourself, and you have nothing to do with anybody. The Prophet said, the better person is the one يخالت الناس The one who is amongst the people, and that they can benefit from him. The monasticism, though, won't be mabani. It's not going to be a, ma a, a, a monastery, a physical one but it will be a spiritual one in the heart. That's where the monastery should be. So you have this khalwa, this retreat, this detachment from the life of this world in your heart. So you may be of the world, we exist within it, but the world doesn't, it's not of us. So there should be this place in your heart that's had this type of detachment where you're away from it. And because of the relationship between the physical and the spiritual, Right? And we can't deny there is a relationship there. Sometimes a physical separation is necessary in order to seek the greater goal of the spiritual separation, the spiritual detachment. And so early on in his career, Prophet ﷺ would retreat to Ghar Hira. Later on, he would retreat less and less. But his rank, his spirituality was higher, not lower. Why? Because as it started to become more a part of his spiritual aspect, he had less of a need to actually be physically separated. So he could be amongst people. He could be amongst 10,000 of his companions all around him, and he's spending time consoling people, teaching people all day. But nevertheless, his heart is detached. Right? What did Aisha say about him? She said, 
the Prophet ﷺ would sit in a house with us and he would speak to us and we would speak to him and we would, you know, even have light conversation. But if the prayer came around, the time for prayer, she said, it's as if he doesn't know us and we don't know him. The spiritual detachment, right? And that the, the light of my heart, of my eye, uh, metaphor, is in the prayer. I find it in the prayer. And we said to Bilal, Arihna biha ya Bilal. You know, call the Adan Bilal so that we may find our solace. We can find our respite in the prayer. And that meaning in the prayer is very difficult to achieve unless you have this regular type of khalwa. This type of, you take some time, whether it's a few minutes, sometimes every few months, you might need to go away, just change the scenery and be away and just, you know, think about what you're actually doing with your life, that type of thing. Many of you now are college undergraduates or beyond, but you're in that sort of transitory phase of your life where you're thinking about what happens next, what do I do? And so it's important that you, I think, establish this within your lives now. You know, you have to be people of, you know, of being comfortable with solitude. We enter this world alone and we're going out alone too. And we're going to be asked in the grave when we're alone. And so solitude is kind of the, the natural state for, for us. Um, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would retreat periodically to, to our Hira. Uh, until the time of the Ba'tha, until the time of when the Prophet, uh, the angel Jibreel Gabriel came to him in the form of a man while he was on one of these retreats. And so we'll pick up next time with that, the beginning of the prophethood of Muhammad Wasallam, and what he encountered in the cave of Hira and then what transpired after. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين